Hello, welcome back to my channel. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and share, and comment. Today, we have another sad story with a happy ending. It's a 1989 PRS that has a broken headstock and was uh, quote-unquote repaired with Gorilla Glue. I don't have anything against Gorilla Glue per se. It's a fine product for gluing 2x4s, I guess but it doesn't belong anywhere near a guitar. The problem with it is that it expands and foams when it cures, and that's really not a uh, desirable feature in precision woodworking, such as guitar repair. So here we have a sad mess. It's a classic amateur hack. There's also multiple cracks that don't even, uh, didn't even get any glue. Let's see if we can find a way to clean off this gooey mess. We'll start by popping off the nut. I'm going to sever the last remaining place where the headstock is hanging by a thread with an X-Acto knife. Well, that's not a very good glue job now, is it? I did some research to find out what might dissolve this stuff. I tried a few suggestions such as super glue remover, acetone, alcohol, naphtha, and heat. I had limited success, but the pieces have glue in other places and they just don't fit back together that well. I'm afraid I can't save this headstock. It's just too far gone. We can still save this poor old guitar, but I'm going to have to make a new headstock. I'm going to save this piece though. My goal is to preserve the faceplate and logo and also the serial number on the back. I want to save as much of the original guitar as I possibly can. I'm going to cut this piece off flush with the fingerboard.
There's a little glue on the truss rod, giving me a hard time here. I think I can get these top parts together well enough using dyed marine epoxy. I'll also shade it in with a darker color to hide the ugly stuff. I'll shave the front and back uh, off on the bandsaw and, and make thin veneers out of them. That's coming up next. I'm taping thin dowels to the outer ridge of the fingerboard to ensure that the radius of the fingerboard does not rock left to right when I clamp it to the scarfing jig. It needs to be perfectly square and stable when I route it, as you'll see in a moment. This is my scarf jig. It's made from scraps I had lying around. The routing table is square with the particle board mounting table. I made it during COVID at home when the shop was closed and I didn't have access to my nice machinery, so it's a little crude. I made my own wooden hinges and the scarf angle is adjusted by the long machine bolts. The pipe clamps hold the neck firmly in place. I use PVC pipe and foam pads to protect the neck. The aluminum side rails add rigidity and a smooth surface for the router guides. I need it to be adjustable so I can adapt it to different situations. Okay, it's time to mount the neck into the jig and get everything into position nice and square. This part is critical. The PVC pipe and the foam pad will protect the neck from the pipe clamps. I've already routed one side. I adjusted it so that the cut tape is off right at the bottom of the fingerboard. I also made an extra large base plate with a laminate trimmer for plenty of stability. I clamped a rosewood bridge point to the base plate as a router guide to keep the router bit from cutting into the truss rod. Now that both sides are scarfed, it's time to chisel away the remaining wood surrounding the truss rod and clean things up.
Next, we need to create a new headstock blank. Typically, PRS uses a rather shallow angle on their headstocks, theoretically to prevent headstock breakage and improve tuning at the nut. The angle is only about 7 degrees. Using a piece of cardstock or paper, I draw the shape of the new blank to create a template that I'll glue to the side of my billet. I double and triple check that my bandsaw and billet are square before I proceed to cut it out, leaving just a little bit of extra as I cut out side the lines. I've drawn a line where the face of the nut will be, and using a glass bottom sanding block, I cleaned up the surface that will be glued to the scarf on the neck. I photocopied the front and back of the veneers. I'll use spray adhesive to glue it to the face of the headstock. It's faster and easier than laying everything out by hand. Next, I've made a routing template for the truss rod access pocket. Again, I used a photocopy to trace the hole onto the plexiglass template blank. Double stick tape is used to secure the template onto the new blank. I've made note of how deep the slot needs to be and how long the cut is, being careful not to cut too deep.
The truss rod slot is chiseled by hand and then smoothed out with a rat tail file. I change direction of my chiseling. The wood doesn't like it when going directly into the end grain. It's like patting a cat in the wrong direction. I check it for fit, being sure that the truss slot is deep enough. Before we glue the blank on, I do a dry run first. When I'm satisfied with the alignment, I glue two temporary alignment blocks with super glue on either side of the fingerboard to help prevent floating when I glue it. The new blank has been glued to the neck. I use a yellow carpenter's glue to do this. I added just a tiny touch of burgundy transtint to the glue to help hide the glue line when I refinish the area. Now that the glue is cured, it's time to trim off the excess wood and alignment blocks on the bandsaw, being very careful not to nick the edges of the fingerboard. Now I can start removing everything that doesn't look like a guitar. Yes, that's a kitchen knife. It works better than anything else I have around on hand. It's a nice sharp blade. It works very well. I place double stick tape to the face plate with the intention of using the original headstock as a routing template to shape the new one. I decided against it, however. I wasn't 100% comfortable with the idea. I've done it several times before. I'll shape it with the oscillating sander a little later. So, instead of doing that, I decided it was time to create those veneers from the front and back of the old headstock. I'll slice them extra thick and use my sanding planer to get the precise thickness that I need.
So now I'm presented with the next problem to solve. Gluing one faceplate is usually pretty simple, but gluing both the front and the back veneer adds a whole new level of complexity. The original tuners for this instrument require the headstock be a very certain thickness to function properly. If I glue the veneers now, the headstock will be way too thick. After scratching off what's left of the hair on my head, I came up with this idea. I looked around for some kind of box that I could use as a routing platform. This yellow storage bin was perfect for the job. It would save me a lot of time not having to make a perfectly square box. The box is screwed firmly onto a piece of shelving that I had lying around. I then contrived a neck clamp that's suspended underneath the routing platform. It's spring-loaded and adjustable. It can be adjusted for left or right tilt. A bracket screwed to the big board secures the butt of the instrument using the strap button. I downloaded a free level app and used it to level the big board as it sits on my bench. And then I placed it directly on the headstock to level that to match. I also leveled the routing platform. Happy that everything is perfectly level, I did some math and determined exactly how much I would need to shave off of the front and the back to get my perfect thickness. Now I can finally glue the faceplate veneer on. I use fish glue for this. I then drilled and reamed out the tuner holes, placed the back veneer on, and placed a few tuners in the holes to align the front and back perfectly. I matched up the screw holes and re-drilled them. I tacked in toothpicks with super glue for alignment and clamped it into place using fish glue. Back to some final shaping. Let's speed things up a bit. It's time to deal with the ugly mess on the faceplate. I filled all the cracks and cut marks, then sanded them flush and smooth. Next, I mix up a batch of grain filler tinted with color tone dyes. I count each drop of each color and write down the recipe. I'll use a similar recipe for my tinted lacquer when I do the touch up and I can do sort of a sunburst around the, uh, the outer edge and hide the ugliness.
Okay, we're out of the spray booth, and after selectively shading the ugly spots, I'm quite pleased with the results. I was able to save the original serial number and logo. This one's ready to rock with dignity once again. Thank you for watching and bearing with me through another lengthy repair. Be sure to like, comment, and especially subscribe. Thank you very much. I treasure your thoughts and ideas as well. When we learn from each other, it's a beautiful thing. God bless.